Today, we will hear from Catherine Hoganson, someone that I can remember meeting. My goodness, Kathy, when did I first met you? 1980, maybe. Something like that. When you worked, The first time you worked at the National Center, it seems to me. Right, 81. Sometime back. She is a native of Richmond, Virginia, a graduate of Emory and Henry College and the University of Virginia Law School. So she is an attorney. She has worked both as an attorney and as a researcher. She worked at the Baha'i World Center and the International Teaching Center for some years. Currently, she's a senior consultant for the Office of, Office of Community Administration at the Baha'i National Center. Uh, she's written various, uh, written a particular book, Lighting the Western Sky, the Hearst Pilgrimage and the Establishment of the Baha'i Faith in the West, a fascinating book about the very first pilgrimage of Baha'is to meet Abu Baha in 1898-1899. She's also uh, co-authored another book about history. She helped also with The Gate. Let's not forget that. You don't have that listed here, but we were a consultant for the film on the Bob. And she's currently working on a biography on Horace Holly, The Hand of the Cause of God, and the Establishment of the Baha'i Administrative Order. So we're very much excited about that. She lives in Florida. She, uh, her husband Gary is there as well, and they have two daughters and two grandchildren, some of whom are pretty close to you, it seems to me, if I remember right. So let us turn the presentation over to Kathy. We'll start sharing her screen, and we will hear from her about Horace Holly. Thank you, Kathy, for joining us today. It's a great pleasure. So. I want to start with a brief quote from the beloved Guardian where he says, there are two kinds of Baha'is, those whose religion is Baha'i and those who live for the faith. Needless to say, if one can belong to the latter category, if one can be in the vanguard of heroes, martyrs, and saints, it is more praiseworthy in the sight of God. He hopes you will attain to this high station. I think it would be fair to say that Horace Hotchkiss Holly was just such a believer, one who dedicated his entire life to the faith. One of the interesting things I have discovered in researching this remarkable man is the accounts of people who knew him, and many of them said that at a certain point, which I think would have happened in the late 1940s, early 1950s, he seemed to have undergone an inner change to the point that he became luminous, iridescent. The word luminous is the word most often used to describe him for the last decade of his life. So the question becomes not just what were his accomplishments, but how did he achieve this inner transformation? How did he become luminous? When we look at Hands of the Cause, there are some who seem a little taller than others. And this is certainly true of Horace Holly. Many of his fellow hands made remarks to that effect. In fact, he had become the indispensable man, the man that the, the Shoghi Effendi could not spare for the work of the faith in the United States and Canada, the man that the hands of the cause during the interregnum had to rely on for many, many aspects of their work. So who was this spiritual giant, Horace Holly? Well, the most important thing to know about him is that he was a Brahmin. He was a Connecticut Yankee. He was made of the same granite as the hills in the area of Connecticut, in western Connecticut, Torrington, where he had very deep roots and was born and raised. He came from a family of achievers, most particularly his grandfather, Francis Newman Holly. Francis Holly was an outstanding entrepreneur, businessman. He owned a number of different factories in Torrington and uh, helped to establish a railroad. He became a bank president, a local politician, a man who was a true pillar of the community. And in the process, uh, was able to accumulate a small fortune. 
a fortune that would allow uh, Horace as an adult some at least small measure of freedom to not always be worried about where his next meal was coming from. His father, Edward, and mother, Ellen Wheeler Holly, who went by Nellie, had four boys and one girl who survived to adulthood. Horace was the youngest of these. He made a, a comment as an adult that when he was four or five, a great sadness came over his family. His father, Edward, who had not had his grandfather's business acumen and so never was much of a success in the many things he tried, was also mentally ill. When Horace was about four or five, his father was taken away to an asylum in Hartford, Connecticut, and would pass away when Horace was about 12. Horace most likely never saw his father again. This plunged the family into economic hardship. His oldest brother, Frank, had to drop out of high school in order to take over some of the family businesses. Fortunately, Frank had his grandfather's business acumen and would help keep the family afloat even many years later. His mother began to make women's hats and to work as a milliner out of their home. But he often commented in letters to his brothers many years later that it was a miracle the family that his mother created after the loss of his father, that she created a very tight-knit uh, and uh, loving family. So for the rest of his life, Horace felt very connected to his siblings, especially to the brother who was just a little older than him, Irving. Unfortunately, one of the things that helped Horace to become a spiritual giant was that he was faced with many tragedies, and the loss of his father would be the first of these. He was educated most of his uh, childhood in the public schools of Torrington, but when he was a junior in high school, he underwent a very serious illness that forced him to miss several months of school. So because of this illness, he was transferred by his family to a very exclusive boarding school in New Jersey, Lawrenceville Academy. And this turned out to be a great blessing to him because there he really was able to shine. The family had recognized his genius and felt that his education was important. But there he had professors, uh, teachers, who also recognized his great capacity, particularly as a writer, and were able to encourage and nurture him. As uh, a member of the congregational church from his infancy, because his families were pillars of the community, uh, of, of the church there in Torrington, uh, his grandfather had actually been one of the main people who built the primary congregational church in Torrington. He did not go to Princeton, where most of his classmates from Lawrenceville would go to, a, to college. He went to Williams College, a congregational school of exceptional uh, uh, excellence that his family had a long connection with. There at Williams, he also shone, just as he had at Lawrenceville, particularly excelling in uh, things such as English and history and political science. When he was a sophomore, he was about to finish his last semester. And at his birthday in April of that year, he got a wonderful note from his mother in which she told him that she expected him to become famous. She had a sense that he was going to be somebody special. He was very close to his mother. The previous year, his oldest sister, his older sister, Lily uh, Baker, who was married, uh, had was expecting her first child, and her husband was a naval officer who was, get, who was stationed 
at a small tropical island right off of Puerto Rico, and she had asked her mother to come and be with her during her pregnancy. When Nellie returned to New England, she, had, she brought with her a tropical disease that greatly weakened her. And so shortly after his birthday, and at the end of his uh, spring semester, the college received a, a, a telegraph asking that Horace be informed that his mother had passed away suddenly from a stroke. This was a loss that was devastating to Horace. He returned to Williams the following fall semester for his junior year, but his heart was no longer in his studies. And his older brother, who was also a college student at another university, felt the same. So the two determined during Christmas break that they would go off to Europe. And there, I think they intended to hopefully find some measure of consolation and forget this great loss they both had experienced. So rather than go back to Williams for his spring semester of his junior year, Horace and his brother spent several months going around England where they not only did tourist things, but they, they actually did great study of, of many of the places that they visited. They bought books and so forth. While they were there, Horace received a telegram informing him that he had been named editor-in-chief of the literary magazine at Williams for his senior year there. This was a very great responsibility and a great honor, and so they decided to change the ship that they would be coming back to the U.S. on and to move up their travel schedule so that he could get back earlier to make some arrangements for editing that journal. This also turned out to be fortuitous because there on the ship, he met, for the first time, a very tall, willowy, beautiful lady, Bertha Herbert. She was nine years his senior from Bayfield, Wisconsin, a trained portrait artist and designer. She loved the arts and uh, was known for her physical beauty. Here we see a pastel portrait of her done by Alice Pike Barney, which is owned by the Smithsonian Institute, probably done only a year or two before meeting Horace. She had already encountered the Baha'i Faith and had uh, mentioned it, was the first person to mention it to a, a British um, aristocratic lady, Lady Bloomfield, and her daughters while they were all at a party together there in Paris. This uh, turned out to be fortuitous for Horace as well, because not only was he taken by Bertha, but she gave him a copy of My Visit to Abbas Effendi by Myron Phelps, which at that time was the only book of any size that gave a general summary of the Baha'i Faith. It would be difficult to say which had the greatest influence on him at that time, but his heart was taken both by the book and by the lady. He had to make up the semester, so he went to summer school at Columbia University in New York City, where Bertha was working that summer, and they spent uh, many uh, times together. Horace went back to Williams that fall, and everyone, I think, uh, expected him to graduate on time and probably to do something like go to graduate school in English or to enter the world of, of writing and editing. However, he surprised everyone at the end of October when he announced that he was dropping out of college and leaving immediately for France with Bertha after they married very quickly at a, a church in New York and uh, it would become apparent the reason for this rash and, and very fast decision uh, a few months later when it was obvious that Bertha was expecting a baby. They left uh, after a very short ceremony at Grace Episcopal Church in New York. The next day they headed 
back across the Atlantic and spent the winter in Paris where they were with people like the Dreyfus Barneys and uh, other members of the Paris Baha'i community. And then they moved to Florence, Italy, where both of them were trying to uh, work in their crafts. Horace was starting to work as a writer full-time, writing poetry and plays. And Bertha was doing painting and starting to do some fashion design. Their daughter, Hertha, was born in June of 1910 there in Florence, Italy. And uh, so he suddenly was not just a husband, but a father at age 23 and getting adjusted to living in Europe. Uh, for health reasons, they moved from there to Siena, Italy. And life seemed to be quite pleasant. He working at his desk all day doing writing, she doing her painting, and they had uh, people around who helped with the child care and the housework. And he just enjoyed reveling in, in uh, the ancient ruins of Italy and the countryside and getting to know the people that they were associating with in that, that uh, area of Siena. So in 1911, in August, they received a telegram from Hippolyte Dreyfus asking them to come to Thanon, Daban, where Abdu'l-Bahá had uh, just arrived in France and it headed straight there. This, of course, was the famous mineral baths and uh, it was supposed to help people with rheumatism and he certainly suffered from that. So before he was to begin his arduous European visit in 1911, he went straight to that spa and Horace and Bertha and their little daughter, Hertha, were summoned to meet with him. And as you can imagine, and I'm sure many of you, particularly during the bicentenary year, uh, or the centenary year when we um, uh, celebrated the 100th anniversary of Abdul Baha's visits to the West, probably read his amazing uh, account of that first meeting with Abdul Baha. And I'm not going to do the time to go through all of it, but I want to bring out two qualities of that. First of all, he had an inner conversion experience from encountering Abdu'l-Bahá there in, in France. And Abdu'l-Bahá actually urged him to write about the experience, which he did, uh, and he had it published. But what we often forget when we read through that wonderful account of uh, his first time with the Master is what he says at the end. After meeting with him, he said, we men and women, heirs of Baha'u'llah's manifestation, labor to erect the house of justice amid the increasing charity and enthusiasm of the world. So that really became his life's work, the establishment of the universal house of justice from that first visit with Abu Baha. He and, and his wife had a number of opportunities to see Abdul Baha in Europe. They uh, journeyed to Paris in 1911 and saw him there. And then they were living, uh, they moved from, from uh, Italy to Paris sometime in early 1912 and were there in 1913 when Abdul Baha returned to Paris and was there off and on for about six months. That second period in Paris is particularly important because Abdul Baha did not at that time uh, do many public talks, really none during that period. Instead, he only met with the Baha'i community and with um, the um, uh, some of the Persians there in, in uh, Paris. So it was uh, a very important period for Paris to have very close association with Abdul Baha. In fact, on uh, every Monday, Abdul Baha would go to the studio, the art studio of Edwin Scott, who was an expat, expat uh, painter from the United States who was residing with his Baha'i wife there in, in Paris. And they would uh, host Abdul Baha every Monday at his studio. And Bertha and uh, Horace lived just across the street from the, the Scots on this little cul-de-sac. So they just had to go out their front door and they would be right there practically. And Horace in, in Paris during this period 
began to uh, take up something new, which was he opened an art gallery, the Asher Gallery, just around the corner from where they lived. And uh, Abdul Baha apparently visited the gallery while they he was uh, there during those those months of 1913. Here we see him in front of it. So he would sit there all day working on his poetry and visiting with people who came into the gallery while uh, she was uh, busy trying to become established as a uh, fashion designer. She sort of uh, specialized in ladies' evening. Uh, cloaks and things with color, very colorful pillows and so forth. And he specialized in post-impressionist paintings in his shop. Um, John uh, Ferguson John, from Scotland is probably his most uh, famous painter that he was um, uh, selling, but uh, he had some moderate success with that. It seems from the study that I've been doing of the times that the people in Paris, particularly in the art community, which was the main group that Bertha and, and Horace were associating with, were so swept up in the idea of uh, the, the ideas of the Belle Epic, when people could cross national boundaries easily, where there was great interchange of people that they didn't, most people did not see World War I coming. Abdul Baha, of course, warned the Baha'is about it. And so taking a cue from Abdul Baha, Horace Holly actually wrote uh, a newspaper uh, commentary in 1913 predicting that there would be war between Germany and, and uh, England. And a year later, uh, somebody pulled that out and, and uh, noted in print how uh, far-sighted that was. But in the summer of 1914, after the assassination of the Archduke in Sarajevo, life in Paris didn't change much. And so the uh, even after war was declared in July, it, it didn't change much. So he and, and uh, Bertha and it made their usual plans to vacate Paris during the month of August and early September and go to a cottage in the countryside. And it was there that uh, Horace, with his four-year-old daughter and her nanny, received a telegram. Bertha had gone back to Paris. And when she got back, she realized that the situation had become very different from what the government had been telling people. They had been lying to the general public about how badly the uh, French troops were being defeated in the north of the country and in Belgium. And she realized that they needed to flee. So she sent him a telegram asking him to come immediately to Paris, which he did. Uh, he finally found out what was really going on. In fact, he found it out when he got to the train station. He spoke French fluently. And there were people returning from the front uh, talking of atrocities. And so they quickly packed up. He went back to the country to get uh, his daughter and, and the nanny. And then they had a very harrowing 36 hours of trying to escape Paris when many routes were starting to close. And of course, all forms of transportation were quite full. By the time they were, traveled to the train station in the middle of the night, the suburbs of Paris were already being bombed by the Germans. Horace made it clear that had they not had a four-year-old daughter, he would have been happy to stay. But they couldn't put their daughter in danger. So they finally make it to England. And then uh, in November, they sail to the United States with the ship uh, uh, going full blast the last several hundred miles because they thought they were being, the captain thought they were being trailed by a German uh, sub and uh, made it safely to Manhattan. So for the rest of his life, Horace was uh, very interested in the whole, whole issue of war and peace, how do we prevent war, and how do we have world government. And that experience of having a very close call with the beginnings of World War I, seeing the troops, seeing the wounded, talking to people from the front lines, and hearing of the atrocities, uh, was something that uh, he never forgot. And his thinking about it over time evolved. 
So when they get to New York, he becomes part of the art community in the Greenwich Village area. He spends a lot of time uh, with other writers and poets. He's having uh, great luck with getting his own works published, but particularly poetry and essays. And in 1916, he has probably the apex of his career as a poet, where his poem, Crosspatch, wins honorable mention in the first poetry contest of the Poetry Magazine, which was the main um, magazine for poets in the United States. He was well known as a poet. He was often uh, lumped in with the group called the Imagist. He was known by, uh, personally by many of the American poets who were working outside of, of the United States. And then when he gets to uh, the United States, he becomes uh, a colleague of other poets in the New York area and other creative people like William Carlos Williams and um, uh, Michelle Duchamp and, and so forth. And he's having his poetry reviewed. In the the um, a review of his one of his books of poetry that was published in England, the uh, reviewer said he was the reason nobody bought poetry anymore. So he was uh, accustomed to being um, criticized. But he also was around these people who were great thinkers and who could help him hone his craft as a young man. Remember, he's only in his early twenties. So what was he like, the adult Horace? Well, for one, he was the smartest guy in the room. He had taken up smoking when he was a teenager, so he was a chain smoker, liked coffee. He had a very keen sense of humor. He was quiet, but when he spoke, he often had profound things to say or something witty to say. Uh, he was considerate considerate of others. He was very close to his family. He was a good dancer, which is not something you normally associate with Horace Holly. He liked singing. Um, he was very, very well read. He also was very keen on current events, so he, he uh, subscribed to a number of, of newspapers and journals and would often write letters to the editor of the New York Times. Um, he was a very urban man. He loved New York. This was in Paris. He also had a very strong interest in art and beauty. He could enjoy watching sports, but those weren't his thing. And when he read for pleasure, he read mysteries and later in life became a big fan of the Perry Mason TV series. He was very self-disciplined, studious, serious. Uh, Bill Sears called him an original thinker. He's a very deep thinker. He's a bridge player. And he wasn't very interested in material things. He didn't care much how well their, his living space was decorated. He just put up with it, uh, basically. He was a man of high principles and ideals. If you want to read the closest thing to an autobiography of Horace, read his little uh, plays called Read Aloud Plays, written during the first years when he was back in New York. Uh, Anyone who knows his life will rec recognize uh, that they're autobiographical. And in fact, he wrote to his brother that they were autobiographical. Now, when he got back to the United States, he had already written one book uh, about the Baha'i Faith that uh, was published shortly after the, the master left uh, Paris for good. And uh, the master knew that he was working on it while he was, was with uh, Horace Holly there in, in the, that uh, spring of 1913. And so when the book came out, this is Modern Social Religion, it was praised by Abdul Baha, who was given a copy of it. And then Abdul Baha said something very interesting about Horace. He said, Thank thou God that thou art confirmed and assisted. Thy aim is to render service to the kingdom of Abha, and thy object is the promotion of the teachings of Baha'u'llah. Although the glory and greatness of this service is not known for the present, but in future ages it shall assume most great importance and will attract the attention of the most great scholars. 
Therefore, strive more and more as much as thou canst in this service, so that it may become the cause of thy everlasting glory, and in the kingdom of Abha, thou mayest shine like unto a star. So when Horace returned to the United States, he rolled up his sleeves and was very quickly put to work by the Baha'is in New York. And then, uh, because he was a good public speaker, people from around the United States started asking him to come to their communities to um, uh, speak on the faith. And he also continued to write. Um, in 1924, he was elected to the National Spiritual Assembly. But before that, he went through some great personal trauma. After they returned to New York, the Hollies had one more daughter, and you can see Horace here hold, holding little Marcia. But this is not a happy family. The marriage is already on the rocks. Bertha has tried to leave him for another man at least once. And within less than a year of when this picture is made, they would uh, split permanently. Uh, this was a great trauma for Horace. He wrote to Abdul Baha about it and got a, a beautiful letter about tests and difficulties from the master during this very turbulent period of his life. Um, it was uh, not only an emotional, personal disaster, but a financial disaster because Bertha sort of cleaned him out financially uh, during the divorce. But it was still a very uh, creative period from the time he left in 1909 until uh, the end of World War I, he put out a number of books, and then later in life uh, would do Religion for Mankind. In 1919, he married another Baha'i. In fact, they met in Paris when uh, Doris was uh, attending one of Abdul Baha's talks there. This is Doris Pascal. You can see she's much tinier than Horace. And they're sitting with Fred Schafflocker, the hand of the cause. Doris was uh, close in age to Horace. She was the right person for him. She was a very easygoing, uh, dedicated believer. And uh, they were very close uh, to the end of uh, Horace's life. They had one child, a little boy, who only lived for 17 hours after he was born and never had any other children. So uh, that was one additional family tragedy for Horace. But otherwise, uh, they were a very, very happy couple. And she became his helpmate throughout his uh, time as secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly. In 1924, almost as soon as he was elected to the National Assembly, he was elected secretary. This is the first picture we have that kind of shows the National Assembly, although other people are in there. Uh, and he, from 1924 until 1959, served almost continuously as Secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly, except for a brief period around 1930 to 1932 for personal reasons. During this period, Shoghi Effendi was establishing the administrative order. And uh, in 1925, he was at, Horace was asked to give up his his employment in New York. He'd taken a job uh, writing uh, with advertising because he had so many mouths to feed. And uh, in 1925, he began to work full time for the, the faith and gave up his writing as a, a poet and um, uh, essayist uh, to just concentrate on the faith from that point forward. Um, he was there during the period when the National Assembly was establishing the Declaration of Trust, when many of the uh, decisions of Shoghi Effendi about the uh, establishment of the administrative order were being made. And he had a natural interest in, in administration and systems, setting up systems and constitutions and so forth. And so he was a ready helper of the Guardian during this period. But also, he was a member of the New York City Assembly during this period, which at that time was being used by Shoghi Effendi as the guinea pig for the establishment of all local spiritual assemblies around the world. 
And this is uh, the same assembly that did the uh, drafted bylaws for a local spiritual assembly that all assemblies worldwide now use. So he was very involved with the writing of these two charters for the local and national assemblies, as well as establishing the uh, basic ways that these uh, institutions would function. He also gave Shoghi Effendi the idea for Baha'i World, and so very quickly was called upon by the Guardian to help implement that and uh, as both a writer for it and an editor for it. He was very involved with Baha'i News and other Baha'i publications. Uh, he was the one that helped to get put together Baha'i Scriptures, one of the first compilations of Baha'i Scriptures in the 1920s, Reality of Man, and then later when they updated Baha'i Scriptures, it became Baha'i World Faith. Again, we owe that to Horace. Um, he was used by Shoghi Effendi to assist um, with um, the letters that Shoghi Effendi sent that would be published in compilations, the first being Baha'i Administration. It was Horace who wrote the introduction and then who put in the subtitles with the permission and um, full blessing of Shoghi Effendi. So uh, as additional letters came in, world order letters and so forth, he continued this through the 1930s and 40s. He wrote many, many essays that were published for the Baha'i community and uh, was responsible for frankly, most of the, the major written documents of the National Spiritual Assembly. Uh, Dorothy Baker would later call him the pen of the American Baha'i community, which would be quite uh, accurate. Um, he was uh, also someone who traveled for the faith. As uh, the NSA secretary, he would make stops in various communities to meet with the friends as part of his work as secretary. Uh, in 19... 21, before he began his work on the um, uh, National Assembly, the Guardian had already taken note of Horace and had mentioned that uh, in a letter that he very much would like someone of Horace's caliber to come to Haifa to help him, but he knew that Horace was needed there in the United States, and so he said, he couldn't leave that post for the present, and Haifa would have to take care of itself for some time. Then in 1929, Horace needed to get, uh, financially, he was in a real bind, because again, personal problems were rearing uh, their heads in his life. His dear daughter, uh, Hertha, the oldest, became mentally ill. This happened while she was visiting Europe, and so she was in asylums in Europe, and uh, there were, were medical expenses. And also, they were trying to help Doris's brother, who had a problem with alcoholism, but who also had a wife and a child to support. So he was trying to not only support his first family and his current family, but he had all these additional responsibilities. And so he told the National Assembly that he could no longer serve as its secretary. And Horace uh, received the following email from the beloved guardian. Much perturbed your withdrawal, both for fundamental principle involved and loss of your unique secretarial gifts. Beg reconsideration. Love, Shogi. Well, he did reconsider for a time, and Doris stepped up to try to help him with the work. But uh, the next year, he just had to, uh, to leave the work of, of secretary for a time so that he could earn a living. Uh, and uh, this lasted for a year or two. Fred Lunt, the previous secretary, uh, became the secretary again. Horace helped during that period, but uh, ultimately they um, uh, once his personal situation uh, improved, he was able to become secretary again full time. Unfortunately, his daughter, daughter Hertha, died as a result of her mental illness at the age of 25. Yet another personal uh, tragedy 
Shoghi Effendi would send him brief outlines of what he wanted in the upcoming Baha'i World volumes. And just like Rehia uh, Kanum often said about her father's drawings, that stonemasons could look at them and immediately know what they needed to do, uh, Horace Halley could look at brief sketches in a, a letter from Shoghi Effendi and know immediately what needed to be done for the next Baha'i World volume and for the summary of uh, the major events that were happening in the world. And so he would write these wonderful uh, long uh, introductions to um, the Baha'i world that explained what had happened in the, the period under uh, uh, examination. And this gave him a worldview that no one else on the National Assembly would have had. So he was really, uh, by having this ongoing work with The Guardian and also working on The Guardian's letters to prepare them for publication, was gaining this great depth of understanding of the work of the faith and the direction of the faith and the teachings of the faith. Here we see him with other members of the National Assembly. This is probably 1930 or 1931. Uh, because Nellie French is the only woman serving on it, a very erudite group, and uh, at the time a bit of an old boys club. Nellie French had to complain about uh, the way they, the men on the NSA comported themselves as a fraternity, uh, but they were learning. They were learning how to administer. The other thing that helped Horace to transform was not just the personal tragedies, but his health. When he moved to Wilmette in 1939, he finally gave up smoking, but being a chain smoker for so many years had finally done its damage. And he started in the 1940s to have a number of health problems uh, that uh, were quite serious, including heart attacks and major surgery. Uh, by the time the Guardian passed away, when the word came to the United States by a telephone call from Rehia Kanum, he actually was in a hospital bed in Wisconsin recovering from back surgery, which was why he was not able to attend the Guardian's funeral in London. Uh, and he actually, uh, during one of these, these terrible illnesses, wrote a short poem that explained how they caused him to transform. This is uh, entitled, By This I Know Is Love. He seized me by the hair and held me over the dread abyss and made me pay with pain for every desperate breath. By this I know his wondrous love. I know by this he loves me more than earth and life or heaven and death. And he wrote that at the Ticonderoga Hospital in 1949. In 1951, he was one of three hands of the cause who were appointed in the first contingent of living hands of the cause in the United States. At that time, the hands did not have to give up elected positions, so he continued to serve on the National Spiritual Assembly as its secretary. And in fact, it's interesting that he uh, would write himself letters uh, as um, a member, as the Secretary of the National Assembly writing to hand of the cause of God, Horace Holly. And this role that was not the institutional voice, but the personal voice of a hand of the cause, allowed him to show the softer side of himself. He was uh, one of the hands who was the first to be uh, uh, when auxiliary board members were appointed for the first time a year or two later to uh, manage several auxiliary board members. And they talk, those who worked under him, such as Florence Mayberry, found him to be extremely lovely, loving and insightful. One time Florence Mayberry was given an assignment uh, as an auxiliary board member and uh, approached Taurus as to what she should do about it. And he pointed to her heart and said, your heart will know, your heart will know. So he began this second service while he's continuing his first service, both as a hand of the cause 
and as uh, an administrator in the United States. He begins to travel the world on behalf of Shoghi Effendi. And as part of those, those visits, he was able to make a pilgrimage to Haifa in 1953. Rahia Kanim said that it was, uh, that the, the beloved guardian was somewhat nervous about Horace coming because he held him in such high regard. He was uh, not certain that uh, the man would live up to the um, expectations. And uh, neither he nor Horace were disappointed, apparently. And in fact, Horace said, the only thing he said about that pilgrimage was you want to give your life for Shoghi Effendi. Uh, it's very interesting that as a man of letters, as someone who wrote and wrote from the heart at very deep levels, the two things he never really wrote about were his times with Abdul Baha other than that initial visit and his visit with Shoghi Effendi on pilgrimage in 1953. After the Guardian's passing, he was the hand who wrote the major documents put out by the hands of the cause. And he and some of the hands in the United States got into a bit of a, um, well, a disagreement with the hands in the Holy Land. They felt a year or two into the ministry of the custodians that the hands needed to make a statement about why there was no guardian, why there was no successor. But the hands in the Holy Land felt, felt that that could only come from the House of Justice. And so uh, he got a slight rebuke for a statement that he and the hands in the United States had, had drafted. Finally, in 1959, the hands of the cause decided that as much as he was needed in the United States, they needed him more. And so they asked him to reside in the Holy Land. And so in December of 1959, with an oxygen tank in tow, he and Doris uh, left the United States for good and took up residence in Haifa. Uh, according to Amelia Collins, this was a very happy period for Horace although he only was there uh, for about seven months until he passed away. At the time he passed away in July of 1960, the hands of the cause were in the process of planning for the 1963 election of the first Universal House of Justice. In fact, he passed away with about 20 yards away from where the first council chamber would be and what uh, is the old Western Pilgrim House on Haparsim. It was sort of like Moses being able to see the promised land, but not being allowed to go into it. There is no way we can fully, in such a short period, encapsulate uh, this giant's life. But I think we can say uh, completely that to his dying breath, he gave every last measure of devotion to the cause and uh, was one of the giants of the, the Baha'i faith of the 20th century. There probably are questions at this point. Thank you so much for this really, really impressive uh, presentation. It 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 warms my heart to hear all of the uh, the stories about Horace Holly, and I suppose while questions are coming in, um, you've given us some idea about his personality, and and that I think really has been helpful. But um, perhaps we could talk a little bit more about his personality as well. There's two things that strike me. One, I, I had meant, used the term taciturn is my impression from what I've heard about him. And the other thing is that a lot of Baha'is didn't like him, is my impression. So maybe you could talk about that, um, just so that we can understand those aspects of him. Well, he was a New England frat boy. I mean, let's face it, he was a, a Brahmin. And uh, many of the Baha'is, I think, um, might have been a little bit put off because I suspect it came across as somewhat elite. 
Um, he certainly was raised in that sort of an atmosphere. And uh, he, um, <coughs> the humor, I think you could describe as snarky. Really? Yeah. Hooper um, Dunbar. Huh? Did he tell jokes? Oh, yes. And he, and he had uh, one of the favorite things that, that he did uh, that made the rounds for a long time because people found it so amusing. But it's also a profound story. Uh, and this comes from Florence Mayberry. Is um, a woman called and, and bent his ear about how one individual in, that, in her Baha'i community dominated the Baha'i community. And he listened very politely. And when she finished, he said, my dear, you are most sincere, but you are most sincerely wrong. And then he told her how all the other eight people were at fault for allowing this person to uh, dominate. Interesting. Which is true. But uh, this, my dear, you are most sincere, but you are most sincerely wrong. Uh, it was um, uh, a good joke for many people in uh, uh, the early years of the administration. Um, he, uh, he, I think, had to, because he was around men so much, I mean, he basically was around his brothers uh, growing up. His sister married when he was still quite young. And uh, so he was, and then he was at boys' schools. You know, Williams yeah. College was all male. Lawrenceville Academy was all male. So he, uh, I think he, he picked up a lot of the, habits you would have at a in that sort of an environment that may have been off-putting to some people, including women, particularly women. The including other, them in French, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing was, and even someone as warm and gentle as Ken Bowers gets this, is the shoot the messenger problem, because yeah. he was the voice of the National Assembly. And uh, people would forget that he was speaking for a corporate body, he wasn't speaking for himself. And I think that the, um, the biggest, uh, I'll, I'll go over the biggest controversy that I know in many people's minds is the Lewis Gregory issue. Right. And um, what happened was uh, by the early 1930s, one of the problems was that we had several full-time people who were being subsidized by the fund paid us paid salaries to go around the United States and uh, give firesides and talks and, and they were paid by teachers. Uh, Lewis Gregory was one of them and Albert Vale was the other. Right. There were other people in that category at various times but those were the two main ones. And what would happen is that the friends would not be doing their own teaching. They would wait until uh, one of these people came to town and then maybe invite their contacts, but uh, the friends themselves weren't learning how to teach. And Shoghi Effendi told the National Assembly to eliminate the full-time teachers. He didn't say, pick on Lewis Gregory. He said, all of them, you know. And the, um, this is also when they're getting into the seven-year plan, mm -hmm. the first major teaching plan. Now, this is also the early years of the Depression. And one of the things that we have to remember is that people at the time didn't know how long the Depression was going to last. They thought that in six months things would turn around, not knowing it would take World War II to make things turn around. Uh, so the National Assembly, when it eliminated the full-time teachers, gave them six months severance pay, which at, the time, at this time was, was quite a lot. I mean, that was amazing. Now, Albert Vail was very upset that he was let go, and he blamed Shoghi Effendi, hmm. which was actually accurate. Uh, Lewis Gregory blamed Horace Holly. Huh. And he wrote... Horace a letter. I haven't been able to see that letter, but I have seen the response to it. And Horace basically said, Lewis, this wasn't my decision. This was a decision of the National Spiritual Assembly. You know, I don't make the decisions for the National Spiritual Assembly. And it's true that he was someone who I think was listened to, 
but he didn't control the, you know, if you look at who was on there at the time, you know, nobody told Leroy Iowas what to do or <laughs> some of these other folks who were on there. And, um, but Lewis Gregory uh, really sort of um, made a lot of negative statements about Horace because of this. And so the National Assembly actually had to send Alan McDaniel, its chairman, to go and speak to Lewis Gregory to tell him to cut it out. Huh, interesting. So, so uh, it was not Lewis Gregory's finest hour, to say the least. But unfortunately, uh, and I think uh, Gail Morrison's, uh, she spun this in her book uh, more the way Lewis Gregory saw it. Uh, but uh, Horace had great admiration for Lewis. I think that Lewis probably didn't understand Horace. Mm -hmm. Horace probably didn't understand Lewis. They came from totally opposite planets, you know. Right. Um, but uh, they, Horace had great admiration. And in fact, he write, writes a wonderful tribute in, at the bottom of an official letter uh, when Horace, uh, when Lewis is going all over the South and says that he's the only person in the United States who's truly living up to the spirit of the Dawnbreaker. So he uh, he had tremendous uh, admiration for Lewis Gregory, um, but um, I think that uh, the fact he was quiet, he didn't uh, toot his own horn. I mean, he was he was um, he showed up one time for a national spiritual assembly meeting several hours late, mm -hmm. and just said, "I'm very sorry. Please excuse me." What he didn't tell them was he had woken up blind in one eye. And he went to the doctor. That was why he was late. But he never said anything about that. He oh. was very he did not wear his troubles on his, his sleeve. And uh, so people didn't see that human side of him. They didn't know about all the, the tests and difficulties he was going through. For example, when he told the local, the National Assembly in 1929 that he needed to get a job, a real job, he didn't say, because my daughter's mentally ill and I've got an alcoholic brother-in-law, we have to support his wife and, and child. It, it was just, you know, I'm, I'm telling you all I'm going to tell you <laughs> sort of thing. And um, so if people didn't see that human side because he didn't tell people his troubles. Interesting. You had once said that he didn't do a lot of talking to me. Did he give speeches at the national conventions? Oh, yes. And his speeches were outstanding, well prepared. And, and uh, we have uh, some recordings of his speeches that um, one or two have in the past been made available by cassette. Um, uh, we have a number of the drafts of the speeches as well. Uh, he, he, he gave outstanding speeches. and. Uh, from people who were there the last years, particularly after he was a hand of the cause, at national convention when he wanted the floor, suddenly they would stop whatever else was happening in the consultation and he would uh, be allowed to get up and speak. So he, uh, he was a very good public speaker. He didn't mind performing. I mean, he, he was in choirs in college. He was in amateur. Uh, theatrical productions and so forth. So he, he, he was quiet, but he didn't mind getting up in front of people. We do have a question regarding the New History Society and the uh, difficulties in New York. Is there anything you can tell us about his involvement in the, the, um, the problems with the New History Society and Sohrab and the court case? Oh my, he was uh, very much involved because he was chairman of the LSA at the time. And there were individuals who um, characterized the problem as being a personality clash between Sorab and Horace. Oh. And uh, Horace, I think, saw it very early on for what it was. Um, one of the big problems was that people don't think about it, was Sorab was particularly for the New Yorkers, the voice of Abdu'l-Baha. Okay. Abdu'l-Baha would speak and he would be the translator. But not only that, Sorab, of course, left and went uh, back east with the master. And he was the one translating all their mail. So, right. for example, when Horace writes to the master about his marital problem, who's translating that letter? Uh -huh. 
So Surab had all the dirt on all the New Yorkers and many, actually on many Americans. If anyone had poured their heart out and their problems to the master, Surab knew about it. And there were many people uh, among the longtime pillars of the New York community who loved Surab. New York Assembly had to go and meet with the National Assembly about Sorab. And it's interesting, um, Shoghi Effendi wrote to the National Assembly and basically said, please, you folks take care of Sorab because if I have to do it, it will break the hearts of these pillars of the New York community, these longtime um, dear friends. And uh, yeah. So, but this was covenant breaking in slow motion that went on for a, quite a, probably about 10 years before they finally had to, um, to do it. And it's very interesting. There was one in the same meeting where uh, at that time, Bertha Kurt Lotz, who was the first full-time or first employee of the National Assembly. I don't think she was. Um, she wasn't full-time. Um, New York Assembly as well as working for the National Assembly and she must have been there taking exact notes of a meeting where they were discussing SORAP and Lewis Gregory says this and Roy Wilhelm says this and so forth and you read this it's like a transcript wow. and just from reading you can tell who's going to be appointed a hand of the cause and who's not huh. in terms of their understanding of the covenant. Huh. It's, it's very interesting to see this. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, what else did he, he wrote quite a few of the articles in the Baha'i world. Did he write the, for example, the surveys of Baha'i activity frequently or, or what? He also edited Baha'i news or he, he, he did a lot of editing, it seems to me as well. And there were statements of the National Spiritual Assembly that he wrote. Your camera froze again, by the way. 1920s. Oh, okay. Um, uh, in the late 1920s, he um, was um, the main person behind the establishment of World Unity Magazine and World Unity Foundation. Florence Morton was the one bankrolling it, uh, who was another member of the National Assembly, but he was the main person behind it. And when they finally had to... Uh, essentially fire William Randall, who was the titular head of all of that. Forrest took over that journal. It was interesting that um, at the time, I think that people, well, the, the kinds of people who read World Unity, which was uh, a lot of, it was Baha'i light, you know, it was Baha'i concepts, but not necessarily Baha'is writing the articles. Um, there was It was very controversial because it was the individual who did not like the indirect teaching method. So uh, at first the National Assembly was willing to back this up and they had all these World Unity conferences in the 1926-27 uh, um, after one was successfully held in San Francisco. But um, over time there were, it became very controversial and people didn't, there were a lot of people who didn't like it. But World Unity magazine morphed into World Order magazine. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the interesting little side notes of that is Horace had a number of uh, encounters with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Oh, that's interesting. First met, him, first met him in Florence, Italy, and uh, then got to know him on a number of levels in different ways. So he got Frank Lloyd Wright to design the mask head of World Order. So the uh, mask head from the 1930s and 40s was a Frank Lloyd Wright uh, design. But... Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So I think you uh, told me actually. <laughs> some time ago, I think you told me. Yeah, yeah. So I may have told you that. Um, there's actually an article about that. Um, but um, uh, anyway, the the whole he was involved with all every every publication. He had some finger in it at some point. Right. And he he knew a lot about printing. He was good at dealing with publishers and, and, and bookstores, Brentanos and so forth, he would be the one that would go and get the, um, um, 
contracts, work out the contracts with printers and so forth. One of the things he was working on, which will be very interesting in a few years, is when the will and testament was coming to the United States, they had to make arrangements because each country only got one copy of it, and it had to be very carefully kept so it wouldn't be adulterated in any way, altered. And, uh, but also it had to be printed, and he was the one that was making all those arrangements for how to get it printed and distributed uh, among the friends. So uh, he, he had, um, if it had to do with words and getting it in ink and paper, uh, usually Horace had a hand in it. And the Will and Testament was first published in the form of some extracts, right? And then the full thing a few years later, if I remember right. Uh, I'm not sure that that's true, but I'll have to, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure either. Uh, one person has asked when the book should be published, so why don't you tell us a little bit about the process of putting together the book and how it's going and when you hope to have it done? Well, I probably have, I used to say three or four times, I think it's much greater magnitude uh, than that, of uh, what I had for lighting the western sky. I mean, wow. it's, very, it's essentially the history of the American Baha'i community as yeah. well and the development of the institution of the, the learned, and so, uh, uh, as well as one man's life. So I have this huge amount of material, and I have some drafts of uh, chapters. George Ronald is very excited about uh, putting the book out, but I think I'm going to need two full years to, one year to finish the writing and another year to finish the uh, editing on it. So my goal is 2022, which sounds like a long way off, but it's not. But that would be the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Baha'i Administrative Order with the, the promulgation of the Will and Testament and the first elections in uh, 1922. So um, that's the goal. Hope, inshallah, I'll meet it. But uh, I've done probably 80% of the research. Good. But um, I'm doing a lot of background reading because Horace is very much a man of his time. You can't understand him without understanding what's going on. Um, and um, I'm now going through the NSA's minutes, which is a very tedious but very illuminating process. During the a privilege, a real privilege to do that. Yeah, yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, and and the context is something that obviously is very important. I was really kind of concerned when I knew a few other people who earlier had been interested in writing a biography that they didn't strike me as able to set him in the context of the times. And that really is quite important to understand what he's going through at the different times in the, the history of the world and the culture that he's living in. So I'm glad that you're focusing on that. Well, one of the interesting things is that he doesn't write a lot about himself. He writes letters to his brother, but his brother wasn't a Baha'i, so he doesn't talk a lot about um, uh, what was happening in the first 10 or 15 years he was a Baha'i uh, with, with his brother. But um, people wrote about him. So, for example, um, the, uh, there are several poets who uh, you would know from a high school anthology who write about him. Mm -hmm. uh, as Round uh, says that uh, uh, Horace was a very nice guy, but he wasn't, uh, he didn't like him as poet that much, you know, and uh, John Gould Fletcher talks about visiting his art gallery, and he goes on for several day, uh, pages about uh, in his first encounter with Horace at the art gallery in Paris. Um, then um, when he gets back in, in uh, he gets back in November of 1914, and then September of 1915, there was a place just across the river from Manhattan uh, in Ridgefield, New, uh, New Jersey, a place called um, Grantwood. It was a, a big property that had a lot of orchards on it, and it had uh, shacks that would be rented out in the summer to art artists from lower Manhattan who wanted to get out of the city. So on Sunday afternoon, Sundays, they would hold a picnic, and a bunch of other artistic people from New York would come across on the ferry to Grantwood and have a, a picnic. And as William Carlos Williams, who was a regular, said wow. it was, it was uh, uh, sandwiches, coffee, and poetry. And uh, 
what's it, uh, they had people like Mar Mar even people like Marcel Duchamp and Stein, uh, was it Steinlitz, the um, famous photographer. A whole lot of people were there. The New York Times did an article on it and said that Horace was a regular. Mm -hmm. And other people talk about Horace being there. He never talks about being there. But what would happen is the editor who was um, was uh, uh, the, the one that uh, hosted all this, these were a bunch of introverts, <laughs> you know. They were artistic, creative people, but they were introverts. So they would hand him a poem or something they were working on, and then he would read it aloud, and then the group would start talking about it. Oh. So he's listening to the most creative minds in the United States talk about their works under production in these picnics over there in Bridgefield, Connecticut, uh, New, Jer New Jersey. And, um, I mean, he had quite an education to prepare himself for his service as the great writer of uh, the high faith in the 20th century in English, other than Shakespeare. So uh, he, he's um, honing his skills. And in fact, it's interesting, Harriet Monroe, who was the editor of Poetry Magazine and the Grand Dam of Poetry for the uh, United States, or actually for the English speakers, um, did a retrospective looking back at the period just before World War I and, and this, this group of new poets coming out, breaking the mold from the Romantic period and so forth, and people like Frost and so forth. And she lists 10 people that had been up-and-coming poets who didn't stay with it. Huh. And Hart is one of them. And she said he left it behind because of religion. Huh. So That's she had, Yeah, I think they met. Uh, there was a big dinner in New York uh, with a bunch of the poets, and um, um, she met him at that. But... Uh, in fact, there was one thing I didn't read because I wasn't sure at the time, but let me read this letter. Uh, when, in 1925, he had to give up his whole dream of being a professional writer. Uh, he got a letter from Charles Mason Remy, and Remy was very hurt that his design for the House of Worship had not been accepted. Right. Architect. So... <laughs> Here's what he how he replied to Charles Mason Remy. He said, as a writer, or perhaps I should say as one who likes to write, I know something of the terrifically complex inner experiences which a creative mind goes through when the aesthetic sense comes into conflict with some unusual spiritual situation. I am certain that other types of people cannot appreciate this particular and most exquisite form of agony. The strange thing is that those of us who have been most certain of the special manner in which we were qualified to serve the cause have been the ones who had to learn the difficult lesson that some other method of service might be more acceptable to everyone. Why these things should be, we, none of us, can fully understand, but the outcome is a more deeply seated obedience when the victory has been won than would be possible in any other way or under any other conditions. Fantastic. And it's interesting. Um, one of the things he did in Wilmette was join Rotary and yep. ended it up until he left uh, in 1959. And uh, Ken Bowers told me that there were elderly members of Rotary in Wilmette who remember Horace, huh. and they had no idea he had ever been a professional writer. Huh. They had lunch with him every week, and he never talked about that side of himself and the fact that he had actually uh, become, uh, had quite a name in the early 20th century as a poet and essayist, and um, was being published in all sorts of major uh, journals of the time. So he, he kept that, he'd thrown it away, and he never went back to it. That's Great. really interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. Well, I think we're just about out of time. Um, so perhaps I should thank you again for this very, very intriguing and fascinating uh, glimpse into the life of Horace Holly, who is one of the great giants of the American Baha'i community for all time. There's no question about that. Many would have said that the administrative order wouldn't have looked the same 
if it weren't for his contributions to fleshing out the Guardian's, you know, guidelines and, and, and uh, principles, um, because these things are interactive, after all, between the, the head of the faith and the people who implement the decisions. And then they, the way they implement it, of course, shape the next level of principles that come along. So thank you so much for this really, really fascinating hour and a quarter. And uh, I, we're looking forward to hearing you again in another month or so when you talk about the first pilgrimage.